I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, officially excommunicated. The Vatican declares Archbishop Vigano guilty of schism. We have a report from Rome. Swing state politics. As President Biden visits Wisconsin, EWTN's Owen Jensen is on the ground looking at key issues for voters. We did it! <laughs> It's a new day in the UK. As a Labour Party wins big, we have analysis. And Hurricane Barrel. The Category 2 storm made landfall in Mexico and is now forecast to hit the US. We'll tell you where and when. These stories add more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us. Our top story tonight, the Vatican officially excommunicates Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, the papal nuncio to the United States, from 2011 to 2016. The ruling comes after Archbishop Vigano defied a summons last week to appear before the Vatican office on the doctrine of faith. There, he was said to face charges of schism. After an ongoing confidential penal process that concluded on Thursday, Vigano was excommunicated and found guilty of schism, which is considered a canonical crime of refusal to submit to the authority of the Pope. It is also the most serious penalty a baptized person can receive being placed outside of the communion of the faithful of the Catholic Church and denied access to the sacraments. Archbishop Carla Maria Vigano was appointed papal nuncio to the United States in 2011. He is known for managing the Holy Father's 2015 visit to the United States, where Pope Francis canonized St. Junipero Serra outside the Catholic University of America and addressed the joint session of Congress for the first time. After this historic visit in April of 2016, Vigano turned 75 and then submitted his customary resignation letter. He was replaced by now Cardinal Christophe Pierre. But in 2018, Vigano released a bombshell report accusing the Holy Father of ignoring and failing to act on the now confirmed abuse allegations against former Cardinal and one-time Archbishop of Washington, D.C., Theodore McCarrick, and called for Pope Francis's resignation. Vigano went into hiding that same year. A later Vatican inquiry cleared the Holy Father's actions related to the McCarrick scandal. Now, seven years later, the official Vatican process concluded Vigano's excommunication was based on his ongoing public refusal to recognize and submit to the Supreme Pontiff's rejection of the institutions he serves and questioning of the magisterial authority of the Second Vatican Council. Vigano rejected the process and the potential excommunication and did not present a defense of his actions to the Vatican. On June 28, his social media statement further accused Pope Francis of heresy and schism over his promotion of COVID-19 vaccines and his overseeing of relations with China and the process to appoint bishops there. Vigano's excommunication can only be lifted by the Holy See. Joining us now from Rome is Frank Rocha, senior Vatican analyst for EWTN News. Frank, good to be with you. Um, so this is the most severe penalty that can be imposed on a baptized Catholic. What does the penalty of excommunication actually impose? Well, exclusion from the sacraments, exclusion from the liturgy, uh, and the person can't hold uh, church office. Uh, so th those are the major uh, restrictions. Yeah, and Frank, how unusual is it for the Vatican to declare a bishop or archbishop excommunicated? Well, it's very rare. I mean, the cases that, that come to mind, and uh, about 20 years ago, Archbishop Malingo of Zambia uh, was uh, excommunicated for ordaining some bishops without permission of Rome. Uh, in the night, late 1880s, Archbishop Lefebvre, the traditionalist French bishop, was, exclu uh, was uh, excommunicated for the same reason. Uh, in this case, uh, it's uh, for promoting schism, fermenting schism, not by deed, not by uh, ordaining bishops, as far as we know, but by words, by uh, questioning the legitimacy of the Pope and by and of the Second Vatican Council. Yeah, and how did Archbishop Vigano, a senior Vatican official under two popes, uh, end up in this position in the first place? 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, when he was the second in command of the Vatican City State Administration under Pope Benedict, he was a whistleblower, so he was already already known as a vocal and combative personality. Uh, but then, when his role as uh, Pope Francis's envoy to the U.S., he helped plan the trip to the U.S. for Pope Francis in 2015. He helped choose bishops for the U.S. Uh, I don't think anyone could have predicted that uh, then after his retirement in 2018, uh, he would come out with this shocking accusation that the Pope had uh, basically favored uh, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, despite knowing his history of sexual misconduct. And he called on the Pope to resign, which was very shocking. And in the years since then, he's increased his criticisms. He's, he's accused the Pope essentially of heresy of, and of promoting LGBTQ agendas and environmentalist agendas and unchecked immigration. And he's linked him to Davos, the World Economic Forum. And, he, and he's criticized Vatican II. He's rejected Vatican II, even though he spent his entire career as a priest and bishop in the post-conciliar church. But he's apparently discovered that Vatican II was illegitimate. So his, 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 his criticisms have grown much more severe and extensive. And, Frank, before I let you go, quickly, what do you think this case of Archbishop Vigano says about the state of the church today? Well, it certainly reflects some of the tensions that exist in the church uh, under Pope Francis. When Archbishop Vigano came out with his accusation and his demand for Pope Francis's resignation, several leading U.S. bishops came out in support of Archbishop Vigano, or at least vouching for his credibility and saying that his accusations need to be taken seriously. And that certainly wasn't—didn't go over terribly well at the Vatican. And, there, and as we know, there have been tensions between the U.S., many of the U.S. bishops in the Vatican. Uh, the other thing I think that's interesting is that uh, how we see church politics so to speak, uh, uh, converging with, intersecting with politics at large, secular politics. Archbishop Vigano became a supporter of President Trump. He started to weigh on on COVID vaccines and on the demonstrations in 2020 about globalism. So I think that's uh, the, we, we see church politics and, 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 and secular politics converging. I think that may be largely the effect of social media. But in any case, it's an interesting development. Yeah, indeed. Frank, thanks so much. We appreciate your analysis today. Frank Rocco, Senior Vatican Analyst at EWTN News. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, the United Kingdom has a new prime minister and a new party in power. For the first time in 14 years, Labour candidates are taking over after yesterday's landslide victory. Today, outgoing Prime Minister Rishi Sunak offered his resignation. It is important that after 14 years in government, the Conservative Party rebuilds, but also that it takes up its crucial role in opposition professionally and effectively. Sunak also says new Prime Minister Keir Starmer is a decent and public-spirited man. Starmer is considered a centrist with a platform of fiscal responsibility. He says that he is ready to get to work. With respect and humility, I invite you all to join this government of service in the mission of national renewal. After yesterday's voting, Labour has 412 seats in Parliament, just short of its highest total ever. The current tally from the BBC finds Labour wins 412 seats, Conservative candidates have 121, and Liberal Democrats claim 71. And for more analysis, we go to Fred Deforsad, Director of Parliamentary Affairs at the Legatum Institute in London. He is also a former Conservative Special Advisor. Fred, good to be with you today. So what do you attribute this landslide victory to for the Labour Party? Thank you for having me on. It's great to speak to you today, Tracy. So this victory, this uh, defeat for the Conservative Party is a better way of describing it. The Labour Party has won a massive landslide with over 400 MPs, the largest number of MPs uh, that they have received since 1997. However, their vote share since the last election has only has barely crept up at all. It has almost stayed exactly the same. The real story of this election is the complete collapse of the Conservative Party. This is a Conservative Party that in 2019 won around 45% of the popular vote, had a majority of 80 in Parliament, and has now lost over 200 MPs and has slumped to around 25% of the vote. The Conservative Party has collapsed, and it is a great tragedy for people that want to support conservatism and centre-right politics in Britain. I think the main reasons behind this are immigration, 
high levels of inflation from 2022 and 2023 following the war in Ukraine, uh, and a party who has lost trust with its electorate, where ultimately promises were made in 2019 and they were just not kept by 2024, and voters who stuck with the party for a very long time have basically got fed up and have abandoned them. Fred, for those who may not know uh, a lot about the new prime minister, could you tell us a little bit more about him? And how do you think the party will tackle some of the key issues for voters? Great question. So Sir Keir Starmer has been a Labour MP since 2015. Before that, he was a human rights lawyer. He's been one of the, the country's leading campaigning human rights lawyers for a very, very long time. He wasn't active in Labour Party politics for a long time before he became an MP. So he was relatively new to Parliament and to politics. But what we do know about him is that he always he came from, if not a quite radical left background, but a quite sort of intellectual left background where he was very interested in socialist politics, republicanism as in um, removing the, uh, the monarchy rather than the GOP uh, and, uh, and, and human rights. And Fred, quickly, before I let you go, uh, there were a number of mm. Catholic leaders who actually lost seats yesterday. Um, you know, what did those results signal for religious and conservative issues in the country? It's an interesting point. Um, religious issues do not become a headline issue in Britain at matter of a general election, um, particularly Christian issues. Um, the, the the political parties we have don't set out immediate like policies on the issue. We have plenty Christian, Protestant, Catholic, Anglican MPs. But overall, aside from issue, aside from life issues which come up in Parliament from time to time, whether that's euthanasia or abortion, it, re it remains relatively quiet. I think euthanasia will be an interesting issue for the next few years. The Labour Party looks highly likely to try and legalise assisted suicide. So I think there's something that um, religious MPs will be very concerned by. But recently, the big issue regarding religion is less to do with Christianity and more to do with Islam, because we have large numbers numbers of voters voting on single issue matters around Israel and Palestine, which have had a, a rather interesting effect on the election in certain parts of the country. Well, Fred, thank you so much for weighing in and for all your insights. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Our President Joe Biden returns to the campaign trail today, making a stop in Madison, Wisconsin, a key battleground state. What's Joe going to do? Is he going to stay in the race? Is he going to drop out? What's he going to do? Yeah. Well, here's my answer. I am running and going to win again. Yeah. Well, the president is trying to bolster support for his campaign after doing poorly in last week's presidential debate that even some Democrats called for him to drop out of the race. Yesterday, Biden told supporters, I'm not going anywhere. Oh, when voters in Wisconsin make their choice for a president, abortion may be on their minds. The swing state has been wrestling with a life and death issue for many months now. EWTN White House correspondent Owen Jensen traveled to Wisconsin to see how the fight for the unborn is unfolding. There he spoke with one young woman who shared her life-affirming story. Here in Wisconsin, abortion keeps making headlines, including here at the state Supreme Court in Madison. I spoke with pro-life advocates who are following the issue very closely, while at the same time trying to change hearts and minds. Isabel Thompson credits adoption with saving her life from abortion when she was just a baby. All glory be to God that I was kept and able to live um, given the chance at life. Speaking to me outside St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic Church in Madison, Wisconsin, Isabel, who is Catholic, firmly believes life begins at conception, just as the church teaches. And to her mother, who put her up for adoption all those years ago, she says, um, Just thank you, um, not only for giving me life, but you gave my parents a child, something that they couldn't have. Um, adoption is one of the greatest blessings. Abortion is at the heart of an intense legal battle in Wisconsin. Pro-life advocates believe an 1849 law protects the unborn. Right now the case is awaiting a court decision. The legislative director of Pro-Life Wisconsin has been following it very closely and he's worried because of the Wisconsin State Supreme Court's current makeup. We're facing a new problem, an even greater threat, is not only would this um, radicalized court, and they are radicalized, this 4-3 liberal majority, not only are we looking at them ruling 94004, our abortion ban, unenforceable, overturning it, they could be looking to find a right to abortion in our state constitution. Bishop Donald Hying told me what the church in the Madison area is doing to protect the unborn. 
Uh, our goal is certainly that every one of our parishes has uh, people equipped and formed to, to receive, to welcome, to accompany, and to really practically help both women and men that find themselves in crisis pregnancy or crisis parenthood. What would he say to Catholic President Joe Biden? Yeah, I would say, Mr. President, uh, we invite you to look at what the church says about the dignity of life. And I think it's important to point out that abortion isn't wrong because the Catholic Church says it's wrong. The Catholic Church says it's wrong because it's inherently wrong. Tom Usley, with Students for Life, says states now have the power to push back. And then with states like Wisconsin, of course, it's a battleground state to be sure. Um, but we also see just more and more people are really coming to the realization that, okay, it is on us now to step up. We no longer have the excuse of, well, Rose in the way, we can't do anything about abortion. Now is the time that we really do have the power. And back at St. Thomas Aquinas, Isabel told me abortion is not the answer. And God is the source and summit of our, our life and our foundation. And when we turn to him, we find life in, in every aspect. Her advice to expectant mothers unsure what to do next, who may be considering abortion. A pregnancy that you'll go through is nine months of your life, and that is, that's hard to give that up, even if you know, you're not going to keep that child, especially if you're not going to keep that child. That's a hard nine months to give of your life, but that's nine months as opposed to a child's entire life that could be gone. Wisconsin is not the only state where pro-life advocates have their work cut out for them in protecting the unborn. The issue of abortion continues to come up in states across the country. But in the end, ultimately, it will be the voter who decides whether a culture of life prevails. In Madison, Wisconsin, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, the head of EWTN encourages Republicans to keep fighting for the unborn. Chairman of the board and CEO Michael Warsaw writes, the Republican Party should resist efforts to water down its long-standing commitment to the pro-life cause when it approves its platform later this summer. And you can read his entire publisher's note under the headline, Has Joe Red Row? in the National Catholic Register and at ncregister.com. Well, the Republican National Convention kicks off in just over a week. Milwaukee, Wisconsin is gearing up to host the big event where former President Donald Trump could reveal his running mate. Yeah, with President Trump, as you know, there's always excitement around the corner. We're excited to see who his pick is. We don't know yet, and he doesn't have to decide until the convention itself. So we're excited to see what he has in store. Republican National Convention Press Secretary Jacob Fisher tells EWTN that tons of people are going to converge on Milwaukee, bringing millions of dollars to the city. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including message to the Kremlin. Following his trip to Ukraine, why Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban is now in Moscow. Plus, Israel's Prime Minister responds to a missile strike from Hezbollah. In 2015, Pope Francis appointed the Vatican's first ever Auditor General, someone who could come in and oversee the Vatican's accounts in an effort to stamp out financial mismanagement and corruption. But just after two years, he resigned. EWTN's Colin Flynn sat down with Libro Malone to find out what happened. Yes, I was forced to resign because they accused me of embezzlement and spying. None of the, none of the two uh, things that I carried out and maybe they'd confused what they were claiming with audit work. Because, again, they didn't have that kind of um, prof professional auditing at an international financial firm level coming into the Vatican and the Vatican accounts. Yes, you believe they might have mistaken that for espionage? No, I think that they mistook espionage because I was actually checking accounting records in detail. That was EWTN's Colin Flynn speaking to former Vatican Auditor General Libero Maloney. And you can see more of that interview tonight on EWTN News in Depth at 8 p.m. Eastern, as well as the full version on the EWTN YouTube page. All right, now to Russia, where Hungary's Prime Minister is in Moscow to discuss peace proposals for the war in Ukraine. Viktor Orban met with Russian President Vladimir Putin in an unannounced trip to the Kremlin. A few days ago, Orban was in Ukraine, where he urged Vladimir Zelensky to consider Consider an immediate ceasefire. Orban says the number of countries that can talk to both Russia and Ukraine 
is slowly diminishing. And now to the war in the Middle East, where Hezbollah is accused of firing 200 rockets into Israel. The Iranian-backed group says that it targeted Israeli military bases. There were no immediate reports of casualties, and officials say many of the rockets were intercepted. The attack was in retaliation for a strike by Israel that killed a Hezbollah senior commander. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responded by saying, quote, those who harm us are marked for death. Well, Hurricane Barrel slams into the coast of Mexico after leaving a trail of destruction in the Caribbean that left 11 people dead. The Category 2 storm struck the Yucatan Peninsula. Officials say that it is expected to weaken to a tropical storm after making landfall, but could regain hurricane strength as it heads towards Texas. Officials there are already giving warnings to coastal residents. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, lighting up the sky. A closer look at some of the fireworks displays from Independence Day. Plus, Matthew Bunsen takes us to Baltimore and the first Catholic cathedral built in the U.S. Macy's launched 60,000 fireworks last night in New York. The Independence Day display from the Hudson River lit up the night sky here in the nation's capital. The Washington Monument provided the backdrop for the annual fireworks display. Oh, finally tonight, as we continue to mark America's independence and the part that Catholics played in the founding of the country, we look at the first Catholic cathedral built in the United States, the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, in Baltimore, Maryland. Built between 1806 and 1863, the stunning neoclassical cathedral is considered one of the most important churches in the Catholic history of America. EWTN News Vice President and Editorial Director Matthew Bunsen sat down with Father Michael Roach, a church historian on the faculty of Mount St. Mary's Seminary, to learn more. What is the significance of the old basilica in Baltimore? Of course, it is uh, the oldest cathedral, oldest Catholic cathedral in the United States. Uh, uh, a marvelous structure with a great history. Many great events took place there within its precincts. And uh, it's still uh, immensely popular uh, among the people of Baltimore. It is, in a sense, the mother church. Um, yeah, and as that mother church, uh, it has a very close connection with John Carroll. Talk about that. John Carroll never got to see it built completely. And when he died, he was buried over at the seminary in Packer Street in their crypt. Then when the, the old cathedral was finished, then he came over and was buried in the crypt there. Uh, yeah, he saw the significance of having a, a decent, more than a decent cathedral. And he was very broad-minded, so he got the architect, uh, Latrobe, who was a, a Moravian by faith, but uh, I think a pretty incomparable architect in the States at that time in the New Republic. Uh, and he did a, a grand job. So what were some of the challenges that he faced actually getting this cathedral built? The money, of course. Uh, they had a lottery. Uh, so Bingo is not new as one of our fundraisers. He had a lottery. And uh, I think he may have won the prize and gave it back and made them draw again. Uh, uh, and so it took ages to get the cathedral built. And uh, the War of 1812 intervened and it had to be postponed for a while. I think you could see a little difference in the color of the granite between what was done before that one was done many years later. And the, the debt, James Roosevelt Bailey, Mother Seton's nephew, uh, finally pays off the debt well after the Civil War. So what would the population have looked like um, in 1821 when the cathedral first opened? Right. Uh, at its peak, by the way, in mid-20th century, it was... 50%, but I suspect it was probably 5%. Uh, Baltimore had its first Catholic group, not in the Irish or the English, but the Acadians, when they were thrown out of, uh, of uh, Acadia, Nova Scotia, by the uh, heartless British. And uh, they landed in places all along the East Coast and finally around the New Orleans. A number landed in Maryland and in Baltimore. Great Catholic families that contributed so much, the Chatards, the Fleuries, the Raphaels, the Mamoneers. Uh, so that, that was a great gift to us. Oh, another interesting thing. Uh, when Carroll writes his uh, report to Propaganda, he mentions the number of black Catholics uh, uh, 
uh, bond and free. And it's sort of an astounding number. I think it may be close to one-fifth of the Catholic population uh, is African-American, if you will, or Creole-American. For Catholics today, what do they need to know about this basilica as we look ahead into this new century? It's a reminder of the Marian patronage that was so strong among the English Catholics, uh, Our Lady's, Our Lady's uh, Dower, they called England. So when the original English colonists came over in 1634 and later, they brought with him a, a love of Mary. So in truth, uh, the patron, patroness of our archdiocese uh, is Mary under the title of the Assumption. So it's perfect that the, uh, the old cathedral was named after the Blessed Virgin Mary. So I think that, that strong strain of uh, Marian devotion is indispensable for any kind of authentic Catholicism. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.